Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Ashley. I'm Phyllis, and I am an alcoholic. And my sobriety date is December the 2nd, 1980, and my home group is Croton Hudson in New York. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, your friends at GSO have mentioned so many times when they heard I was coming to Old Granddad, they said, oh, gosh, you're going to Old Granddad, and everyone there knows you and sends their very best wishes and has such fond memories. Uh, many of them have come to join you, and I'm very excited that I now have the opportunity. And I want to thank the host committee. I know how much work it is to host and to be of service, you know, to AA in this way. And it does take a number of people. It's never one. It's just like what we do in sobriety. You know, it's never one. It's just a number of us and groups of us and working together that we, we uh, are able to make successes like this. So thank you so much for all you've done. And for everybody that's, that's been here participating, I've had a wonderful time. And it's, uh, it's times like this that we can all join together and form new, um, new fellowship that is so meaningful in our sobriety and enriches us in so many different ways. And one of those, of course, was the biggest treat to me was um, being with Ashley. Uh, I think she knows my story much better than she realizes. She's, <laughs> the, from what she, uh, the questions that she asked and everything, I felt like, oh, you know, she's, one of the one of the people that um, I've gotten to know in sobriety that so quickly that I feel like she's just a, a very close friend now because you know we've shared so many things so she doesn't know how much she really knows much more about me than many other people so um, and I was that way too when I was new in sobriety or she's not new she has ten years but but all throughout my sobriety I was always asking these questions of everybody and everything because I always wanted to know the answers I always wanted to know more and uh, you know sobriety didn't excite me in the very beginning but Soon it did, and I just wanted to know all about it. And so I'm just so thrilled that she was able to share with me and that I was able to share with her and gain a new friend in AA. Um, You know, my story is really one of, um, you know, beginning so much um, into self and so much um, isolation before I even began to drink. And I was raised in a family that was, uh, it wasn't alcoholic by any means, but it was just a loving family. And there was no alcoholism. So, you know, I grew up just not knowing what it was about um, after I took my first drink long after I was a child. But I I was in a very happy family. But I, I realized looking back, I didn't know at the time, but I realized looking back that um, everything was really about me. You know, I mean, it was, um, and I didn't, it wasn't a conscious thing. It was just a natural thing that it was about me. All decisions I made, um, everything that I did was me first. And I didn't want to be that way. I was just that way. And yet, um, and I didn't realize that, I think I was in like junior high or I'm sure it was around junior high or high school, that I began to realize there was a you. And then I wanted to be more like you, but I was still about me and what I could do to be more like you. And But I didn't do for others. I didn't think of others first. It was always me. It was always about self. You know, and what what was it that, and there was this big, gigantic hole in me. I remember trying to do so many different things that filled that up. And whatever I achieved, whatever I did was never enough. It was always more. I needed more. And so none of that worked for me, all those achievements. Um, I did very well in school throughout all my school years, but it was never enough, whatever I did. So I remember taking my first drink very well, I remember. My first drink was when I graduated from high school. And the reason I waited so long was because I didn't know, you know, what it would do for me, But number one. But I just didn't, I was busy achieving things, so I didn't 
even think about drinking. But that was what we did when we graduated. And so I went out, and I, it was just so characteristic of everything that I did, the way I drank after that. Um, I went into a blackout quite soon, and uh, they told me I was funny. I don't remember anything. Um, I woke up the next morning, and I was still in the same place as I started drinking. I was in a cabin up in the woods where everybody went, and there were just a few of us left. And I thought, well, I woke up, and I had a terrible hangover. And um, that was just in just so, like I said, characteristic of the way that I drank after that. Now, I wouldn't often, I never knew exactly when I was going to go into a blackout, but pretty much all the time that uh, I was a blackout drinker. And certainly for the last years of my drinking, I was a blackout drinker. I lost, um, you know, people will talk about the, well, obviously the Vietnam War was going on at that time, and I knew it was going on, but I mean, I didn't realize any of the land, any of the news items, uh, the music was there. I didn't know any of the singers. I mean, people will talk about their, their past. I think it was just total blank because I was in such, um, a period of just, uh, not being present at all in my drinking. I didn't, um, I drank whenever I could, but I wouldn't say that, that I was, um, that, you know, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't a daily drinker obviously right away, but I just drank whenever I could. Went off to college and found that crowd that we do, you know, when we search out, uh, alcohol and, um, just kind of fast forward into my first job, which I thought was going to be the, the answer to all my problems because I didn't think I had a drinking problem. I just knew that I liked to drink. And I thought that there was nothing wrong with it because I didn't really get into trouble then. I just drank and had fun, I thought. So I had this job, and it was in Seattle. And it was, um, you know, I was kind of at the top of the world because I thought, you know, it was the greatest job in the world, and there was nothing really that could stop me. And, oh, I forgot. Um, let's go back to college. <laughs> oh, because it's really an important part. Um, I was, um, I was about a junior and I, this boy that I'd really had liked for a long time, we ended up getting married. Sounds kind of, boy, I liked a long time. <laughs> now I, <laughs> it was kind of important. Um, <laughs> See, I skipped that because um, I really don't want to count that marriage, but I, I ha really have to. <laughs> and we had a daughter, and it's really... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I skipped the marriage and the daughter. Um, so I don't know how I did that. But anyway, it's... Um, and I don't like to really count the marriage because it was a very... It was one of those where... Um, the friends around us were getting married. It was at that time, and I think in the world with the war going on, that we just all decided that we were, a lot of folks thought that they were going to get married. I don't know. There was something about war that does that. And so um, we were only married for about eight months. And after I had my daughter, then um, I decided that I was, that this was, you know, I was not... Um, going to ever be in a relationship again. She was going to be the person that was going to be my um, my one and only, you know, attachment in any relationship. And so men were completely out of the picture. I was so disgusted with this guy. He drank, by the way. Um, he drank much worse than I did. So I was not, and I hadn't drunk uh, at all when I was pregnant, so I was very righteous about all of this. In fact, if I had found Al-Anon, I probably would have joined and been a star Al-Anon at that point, but I didn't know about it. But I did leave, and, and so I had my daughter, and that's when I went off to the big job in, in Seattle. I don't know why I forgot that. Um, and so when I, when I was there, then I began my drinking, I started, I returned to drinking then. And it started to kind of escalate. And when it did, I began to get into trouble. This is a new side of my drinking. And I just couldn't predict when I was going to, um, act out, 
be angry. My drinking had just changed the character. I wasn't fun anymore. So I had to, um, I, I just kind of sidestepped the relationship bit because I knew that I had to have somebody in my life that would be near me and really watch out for me, drive me home, um, do those things, you know, that are an alcoholic needs. So I had, um, I had three men that were, I was dating at the time, and one of them was, uh, and it was complicated, it really was. <laughs> because if you drank like I did, you really can't remember who you have a date with until they show up. <laughs> and one of them was a Seattle um, police detective. And one was, because I was living in Seattle at the time, and one of them was a PI, um, a private eye, and the other was an FBI agent. So I was covered. <laughs> I was really covered. But not for long because they got kind of disgusted that I was so irresponsible that I really didn't uh, know who I was dating. And then they found out about the others, and you know how that goes. So I um, I actually ended up with a, the worst drinker, of course, um, one that really didn't care, and he was a Seattle police detective. Um, he was... He wasn't, um, he was, looking back, I mean, he wasn't as bad as I was, but I thought he was worse because I always had to look at somebody as being worse. And it was his temperament that was worse. It wasn't his drinking, you know. So, but I thought that um, at, I was at a point where I needed to have somebody in my life. I thought if I, if I get married, then I will not drink as much and I will be able to, to stay home, take care of my daughter, and things will be better. I mean, that was just my quick solution. And besides that, I was losing my job. So um, so we got married, and that was that was an answer for me for a while. Now, he, um, you, all I can say is if you know alcoholic marriages, which many of you do, then you know that this, is, this was not successful at all. As a matter of fact, it was, um, it was so ugly at all points, um, you know, the fights and the, the blaming and the accusing and, and you know, particularly when two people are drinking, the hiding of liquor. I mean, I had liquor all over the house in places that nobody could find, not him either. And there was always, you know, that difficulty of challenge of, of making sure that they were in the right place so that you could find them and drink privately. So he um, he worked, of course, and then he he was still a Seattle on the Seattle Police Department. He um, got injured quite severely one time he got shot. And when this happened, I was at home, and the police came to the door. And whenever the police come to the door, then you know that there's it's serious. And so they told me that, you know, he had been injured, he'd been shot, and we went to the hospital. And so when I went to the hospital, then the first thing they did when I sat down was they came to me with his, clothes and his personal effects. And so I thought, hmm, well, he's gone. So I was planning the funeral and thinking, you know, how sorry everybody was going to be for me because, you know, I'd lost him. And and it was really great because, I mean, I was not in love with this man, obviously. (laughs) But I was thinking, oh, this is great. I know he's got insurance. And... (laughs) I'm going to be okay, you know, and I mean, this is this terrible thing to, to say, but it was truly running through my mind. And the next thing that happened was that the doctor came out and said, well, he's ready to see you now. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know why they did that to me, but <laughs> they did. So I, um, he got well. And so, but he was, <laughs> he recovered. And so we um, we continued to drink together. He was out of the police department then with a disability because he was severely injured enough to where he couldn't work for the Seattle Police Department, but he got another job. It was wonderful. It was a liquor inspector for the state of Washington. <laughs> so our lives were charmed, really. We went to the middle of Washington. That's the only problem. We went to the middle of Washington from Seattle, and I did not know anything about... Um, this area. It was very remote. 
and hardly anybody on the West Coast knew about this area. It was up towards the Canadian border, and the only thing that was around was that there were a couple churches and a couple bars and small little, I mean, the bar was, and the, and the liquor store was so small, it, it serviced about three little towns around there. So it was really difficult to come up with enough excuses to, to really, you know, visit the, the liquor store enough times to where you weren't really noticed immediately. But um, I wasn't going to church at that time. And I want to talk a little bit here about God because um, I was raised in a very um, comfortable environment with, with a religious family that it was um, it was a way of life. It was a way of life. And, in fact, I went to church um, up through college and um, stopped really at college when my drinking got worse. And what I did was I feel very strongly that I left my God. My God did not abandon me. I just simply left because I was filled with so much shame. And I knew the way that I was living was not uh, compatible with what I was raised with. And so when I ever, whenever I saw a church, I was not going near it. I was not going near it because I knew that I wasn't deserving. I knew I was not living that the way of life that I should and so God was completely out of my life at that point. Um, it was a time when the, that was the most uh, critical of my drinking. I drank every day because my drinking, obviously, I didn't work, so I drank every day. It went from the afternoon drink to the morning drink to where, you know, all of those times you say, well, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to get that bad. And you do. And I did. Um, it was a time when I had a three-year period that I lived in that, that town that I don't have any recollection. I went back to make amends uh, years later. I couldn't even find my house I lived in. Um, the only place that I could recollect being at was uh, not my daughter's school, but I could remember where the liquor store was. I could remember where that was. I could drive right to it. And I remembered where the bar was. And I could go to bars then because, and I hadn't really been a bar frequenter, but I, I could do that then because my husband was a liquor inspector and they knew that if they kicked me out or if I, if I was not, you know, the most pleasant person to be around, then, um, they get closed down. So it was perfect. I could just sit there and I could drink and nobody said anything. Um, I woke up one day because I was a daily drinker, and I had a moment of clarity. And the clarity that I had was that I knew that I, I knew that I couldn't stop drinking. And I wanted to, I, I couldn't live that way anymore. But the second thought that came into my mind was, it's him. You know, if I just leave him, then I will not drink and my life will be better. So I packed up everything that I had, which was little, and I went to Seattle because Seattle was going to be the place where I would work and I would get busy back into work and I'd become productive and, and not drink. Well, we all know that's you know, what the story was there. I changed my hours of drinking and I was at work whenever I could be at work whenever my hangover just didn't prevent me from doing that, and that lasted for about six months. And one, my boss, who <laughs> later I found out his mother was NAA, and had I known that before, I mean, you know, all of these steps that my higher power led me to, to help me along the way to where I got sober, he told me one day, he said, Phyllis, I think you need to try AA. He said, you, you have a problem with drinking. And I couldn't believe my ears. It's the first time I had ever had anybody tell me. Because by that time, see, I had excused everybody from my life. I wasn't contacting my mother anymore, uh, my sister. Uh, nobody in my life was really close to me, close enough to where they could tell the truth. You know, I just it put them aside so they didn't know. And so when I heard that, then I, I thought, well, the only thing I knew about alcoholism at that point was I had seen Days of Wine and Roses. 
And so I thought, okay, so I know that I can call AA and they'll come. That's what I had figured. But I wasn't quite ready yet. So I, I had gone to a bar that night, and I never went to bars because I was so afraid of going there and getting into trouble that I was a home drinker. I come home, I pick up my daughter from um, from the sitters, and I come home, and I close the doors, and I drink. But that night I went to a bar. And when I was there, then I decided it's time to call AA. And I was almost in a blackout, not quite. And I called, and they said, well, everybody's gone to a meeting. Now, that's what I remember. I'm sure that's not true. Why would everybody be at a meeting if you call the answering service? But that's what I heard. And so I thought, but it made sense to me that everybody would be in a meeting and, and that they would call back. So I went back, and I was drinking. And pretty soon uh, the bartender said, is there a Phyllis in the house? And I said, yes. It's me, and they said, well, Alcoholics Anonymous is on the line. <laughs> so, evidently, I left my number for them. And so, and I thought that's what they did. I thought that made sense to me. So, I talked to a woman that um, she asked me, she said, you, you take a cab home, and we'll talk in the morning. You call me. I remember that. And I remember, and I didn't know, but I'd scribbled her number in my book. And I thought, well, why would I take a cab home? I mean, I got my car. I need to get the car home. So on the way, then um, I ran a red light and I got stopped. And uh, the policeman said, um, he, I told him, of course, I said, well, you know, my husband, who he wasn't my husband anymore, but I said, my husband is a Seattle policeman. I used those kinds of things a lot. And they said, oh, okay, well, then we'll just take you home, which they did. Um, I started going to AA. And I was there for, I went to AA for, for about three months. And, you know, I was, at, I can remember going to my first meeting, raising my hand and thinking it was the best. I mean, I heard... I heard about my disease. I heard how you felt and how you how you got sober and how you were inside and all of those things I identified with. And I was amazed because it's the first time I ever heard anything about myself, the truth about myself. And in three months, I was well. I mean, I just, I mean, because you, because then I started hearing about all the things that you had done that I hadn't done. You know, you'd lost your jobs, you'd lost, you know, you, you had broken marriages, you know, you'd gone to jail, you'd done, been to the hospital, insane as, I mean, you'd been, all these awful things. And in my mind, all I had done was just drink at home. Now, I didn't realize, or I didn't acknowledge the fact that I had, in fact, lost marriages. I had, in fact, almost lost a job. I quit before I lost my job. So, but the justification, the rationalization was all there. I wasn't ready yet. So I drank off and on for the next three years. And I came into AA in 1977, in January. And I w did, I did the most uh, ridiculous geographics. I mean, I, most people, <laughs> uh, most people will go long, long distances, you know, and I just did it in kind of a circle in Washington. And I just kind of lived in different places with different people, trying to get sober in different places. Because I didn't want to be a failure in one place. I just had to move around a lot. Um, you know, we talk about the yets, and, and a lot of people don't like to talk about yets or hear the yets. But believe me, um, I have to talk about them, and I have to talk about the progression. Because I could not believe how fast um, I went spiraled down. When I thought I'd reached bottom, I didn't know what bottom was until I reached it for the very end. I had all of those yets happen every time I drank. It got so much worse. And it was almost like this sign in front of me, it's time to stop now. And none of those things, and it was talked about with other speakers, none of the consequences made me stop. You know, it just, it never did. Um, I went through two treatment centers. Um, I lost custody of my daughter, which was the biggest heartbreak. 
the very biggest heartbreak that I'd ever been through. And that made me drink more because I could not believe that happened to me. I was homeless. I had gone to jail. I'd done all of those things. I asked to be put in Western State, which is our mental institution for the state of Washington. And the woman that um, that ran that organization or that institution, she talked to me and she said, Phyllis, she said, the only thing that's going to help you is Alcoholics Anonymous. A judge told me the same thing. I was on probation for a year after an incident where I had, um, I became quite violent when I was drinking because I was so angry with myself. I hated myself. So then when I would drink, that would all come out, you know, with my drinking. And I took it out a lot on, on cars. Um, I actually, whenever I would be driven to detox, and I would always attack the car. I don't know why, but I, I just, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to go wherever they were taking me. So windshields would go and, you know, whatever else was around would go. Broken legs. I mean, I just, I just was a crazy, crazy out of control drunk. And nobody wanted to be around me. And you didn't want to be around me. Believe me, I went to so many AA meetings. And, you know, I'd go in drunk and I'd leave and I'd wonder why I couldn't stay sober. You know, you had to tell me what was wrong with me, you know, that I couldn't stay sober. And I wasn't through drinking. I hadn't reached bottom. I did not stop drinking until I had that last drink, which I call that was my absolute last drink because I wanted to stay sober long before my last drink. I wanted desperately to stay sober, but I couldn't. So see, I know the grace that this, um, this program gives people. You know, we talk about the newcomers in this program and we treasure and, and honor the newcomers when they come in. Because we need newcomers to remind us really of where we are and also we want them so badly to stay sober and have what we have. But the newcomers are the people that come back again and again and again. Just as well. You know, if I hadn't have had that opportunity to come back so many times, I wouldn't be here today. And if you didn't, a few of you didn't welcome me back, I wouldn't be here today. You know. Um, with all my geographics, I remember going to so many different towns and meetings where people would say, if I would have like a, a month or so, and many times I'd have like a couple of months, and, you know, remember to welcome that person. They're a newcomer. Um, this program is, is this one of the, the um, most important parts, I think, of our program is that we can come back. We can come back. Not everybody is blessed with that sobriety the first time they enter our doors. Not everybody is. And so I will always remember that. Well, I made a promise to God um, when I took the last drink. I woke up that next day and I, I took step one, two, and three all at once. I had totally given up. You know, I had no more answers. And I told, and I promised, I said, wherever I'm needed, you know, whenever I'm needed, I'm there. And there were so many times after that that I really had to do things that, and at times that I didn't want to. You know, I had to make sure that I kept that promise so many times. And every time I did, I got gifts back. You know, I was filled with so much more than I ever gave. So much more. I had to get right into 12-step work. I had a sponsor that was just um, like steel. Um, she was gentle, but she was firm. And she knew how to how to sponsor me because I was so... Um, before I was so determined, you know, to have my way, but now I was just filled with, um, with absolute grief over the fact I'd woken up to the fact of what I had done. I looked at all the wreckage of my past and I could hardly, um, sit in a chair. I was just, I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. 
She gave me enough strength and a connection to a higher power that I had hope that I didn't have to drink just today. Just today I didn't have to drink. And I couldn't do any more right away. And I couldn't expect more right away. And gradually it got better. It got a lot better. And But how it got better was, and this is the only reason for me, and this is just my story, is that she put me in front of people to, so that I could be helpful. She stood me by the door and she says, you're going to be the greeter now. I oh, can be the greeter. How could I be the greeter? I had nothing to give. You know, I had nothing. I felt empty. And she said, you have a couple days more than that new person coming in the door. So you'll be the greeter and you will welcome people to come in this meeting. And I did. I made coffee. I went on 12-step work. And, you know, I didn't go. She said, never go alone. She said, you'll just go with me. And, oh, I loved it. You know, I could share my my story, and which I shared just a very small part of it, but I shared, you know, that I was new, and, yes, I, I understood how they felt, and, and there was an answer, and there was hope. And, and she said, you're much closer to that drunk than I am. At that time, she had 15 years, so, and she was right. She was further away from that, that drunk than me. And... I learned that absolute gift that we have in AA about being able to give. You know, we're the only ones that really can give to each other and, and tell our stories and be able to share that way. So the 12 step work kept me sober. It absolutely kept me sober then. And then I started, as we call, hanging it out and hanging out and just really sticking with the winners. And I have this wonderful home group that I, I was again, it was a gift from God that sent me in the right direction to belong to this group that got me active and kept me active and kept me connected. And I started learning um, gradually, you know, through the time. I started really listening and learning about our program of recovery and learning there was more. And, oh, what do you mean there's traditions? Um, we had step or we had step study and we had traditions night once a month. Traditions, well, what are they? You know, so I learned about them. And then, of course, like some of us do, we become experts. You know, I not only had to learn about these things, I had to, to really know the truth. And so I began to start hanging out at the traditions meetings. We had a lot of workshops when I was in, in, new in sobriety. Uh, the first five years of my sobriety, that's where I spent my time, was just going from meeting to meeting to meeting, a lot of meetings, a lot of 12-step work, and really sharing with others and learning more about the program. And my sponsor told me, she says, you, uh, you have been given this great gift of sobriety, and now it's your job to pay it back. She says, this is not a free gift. And it says in our big book, you know, into actions, working with others. And... So that's exactly what I did. I was following instructions, and that's what I did. And I loved my old-timers because um, they're the people that taught me, and they still teach me today. Um, being available for service to AA, is, uh, it led me in so many other directions that have given me and filled my life full of such tremendous joy. Um, and they were painful, a lot of them, to go through because they were lessons learned. I had to actually just sit still and learn them and know that I was going to get out the other side and I was going to be a better person. And, you know, through working the steps, it allowed me to to have that strength to do it. Um, you know, I want to talk a little bit, too, about the steps. Um you know, obviously, you know, anybody, any of us that have stayed sober for a while know the steps are not something you just do once. You do them again and again and again. And I believe that um, for me, step five, of course, was so critical. You know, I had so much resentment, so much um, anger towards myself and others that was so hidden. But I, I had to do step five. But the, the, I think that the the step that was so freeing for me was step nine, because I had the deep resentment that I really couldn't get through in step five, and mostly it was from my ex-husband who had took custody of my daughter, 
at the time. And he did it through resentment for me and trying to get back at me. And so when I went to him uh, to do amends, I had to do it in a forgiving heart. I couldn't just say the words. And my sponsor was very careful with that. She said, no, she said, you're not going to just go and say those words. She said, you're going to go with a spirit of forgiveness. And there was nothing harder in my life than to forgive this man. And I couldn't worry about what he told me. And it tells us that in the big book. You know, it doesn't matter what the, how they receive it. It's that you are in the right spirit to give the, and the right frame of mind really to, to go in a spirit of forgiveness. And I was finally able to do that at two years sober. Took me that long. Um, but when I did, it was the most freeing thing that, that I was able, and I was, it, he did not receive it well. He came back at me just like I thought that he always would, but it was okay. Now, the real blessing is for me, the gift that I got was that, that I was able to do that just in time because he died six months after that. And I never would have had that real feeling. I could have written the letter, but I never would have had that feeling that I had in going to him personally. There were other amends that I made, but this one was the, really the very biggest one. Um, my, I want to tell you a little bit too about um, being available to AA because I believe that this, um, the program that we have been given, and I believe we have been given this and allowed to have it, so many of us uh, out there that are drinking today aren't able to receive this gift. We, you know, I mean, we are, it's truly a gift because others are not able to get sober. We know that. But, um, that it's, that it's three legacies that we've been given. It's not just a program of recovery. It's a program of recovery, unity, and service. And with all of that, you know, we have such, um, such a responsibility to be able to carry that on to the next person who we sponsor and let them know, you know, that we do have three legacies. I remember when I came in, there was, um, we still had circle and triangle. And it was up on the wall. And uh, it had recovery, unity, and service in the circle and triangle. And we knew immediately what that was. And it was just all a part of, of what we did in AA. It wasn't just recovery. Well, we lost the circle and triangle. And when we did, I think we really lost a large part of our three legacies. So it's really such a great responsibility as we sponsor to make sure that we say that. Who we are, we have three, not just one. And, you know, I think that today in our services, we talk about that more. I am so, so grateful that we do. Because we, you know, that is what we've been given and our responsibility. Uh, I want to talk about being available to AA. And the reason I want to talk about available to AA is because each one of us has that opportunity to do this. And that's the great news, I think, is that each one of us has a place in AA, you know, to give back. Whether or not it's sponsorship or through a committee or through a GSR or whatever, I was... um, you know, I was given the opportunity to be GSR. Now, I know a lot of us will will kind of reflect on those kind of opportunities as, yes, I was railroaded, I was out of the room, and somebody um, put my name in, and I mean, you hear all these stories. Well, in my home group, I have to tell you, um, I don't know, I, I, I was in the right home group because that's where I needed to be for me. Um, they kind of stood in line to be GSR. We had a huge home group, but everybody was just, you had to be two years. You had to have two years of sobriety to be GSR. And so I could hardly wait till I was two years so I could be available as GSR. I wasn't elected the first time. What a disappointment. I really wanted to be GSR. Um, But I was the next time. And uh, then I was able to serve my group. Now, I come from Washington State, and I forgot to mention that. That's my original, um, where I grew up in sobriety, where I got sober. And so I served in in the Washington area. It was one time, very, very large area, and then it divided into two. But when I was active in service, it was the one large area. Um, And it was, you know, I, I saw the people that were serving there, and there was, what I saw was attraction, 
I hope you see that too. I hope we always see attraction in service. You know, it's it's not a chore, it's not a job, it's really a great opportunity for, for fuller fellowship and a, an opportunity to give and share. But I saw this, this joy there of giving that I hadn't seen anywhere else. I didn't see it in the rooms of recovery. I saw the recovery joy, but I didn't see the other. So I kind of followed that attraction and really wanted more of what you had. So and I knew that the only the the way to get it was just to be a, simply there, be present, be available for whatever was next, you know, that was that was going to be next in my life. So after GSR I began to serve in other areas, um committee work, I went into corrections. I loved corrections different than any other uh opportunity that I ever had. Um and still love it, but I don't have the opportunity to go in as much now. I worked in PI and public information and, and the cooperation with the professional community when that came into being. All those committees gave me so much more uh, a breadth of AA that I never saw before and a way to connect. But the main thing is that the responsibility of carrying that message out to people that really weren't able to get it any other way, to say who we are, the people that really are there to help us as alcoholics as we get sober. Um, so I served my area in different ways and was delegate for Panel 47. And just simply by being available and being able to be part of the greater group conscience that you give us that opportunity to do. Um, I served as a Pacific Region trustee for four years and served on the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, like Conley is doing now and and others have, have done before, it is just an amazing experience to be able to serve on a board that serves all of AA, you know, the group conscience of all of AA. And today I'm, I'm serving as your general manager of your general service office in uh, New York. Now, coming from Washington State, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the culture shock. Now, I'd been there visiting before, obviously, when I go for board meetings as a, as a trustee. But um, it's from, from a state that is more rural, and I was living in Olympia, Washington at the time, and had been for a number of years. And moving to, to the city of New York is uh, very different. Um, I'm not... Uh, I found that I'm not a city girl. And so I moved out of the, of the city. I stayed there for a year, and then I moved out, and I'm living now in Croton, which is up the Hudson. And it's a long commute, but it's really worth it once I get there because there's peace and quiet and uh, more of a serene setting. But my work at the general service office, uh, what an incredible, incredible gift I've been given. What a responsibility and an opportunity to be of greater service. And I believe it is a service because it's a dedication of time and myself. Um, it's the first job. I mean, when the, the first thing that struck me was that I've had jobs before, and in AA, we all know when we work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous how much it, it um, reflects on the work we do because we bring all of the principles that we learn in AA into our work, and our work gets just better and better, and more opportunities are, are come about to where when we work the principles in our actual work, then our work is, I mean, I've gotten promotions in, in business that never would have happened before. Never. Um, but I never was able to have a big book on my desk. Now I'm able to have a big book on my desk. It was so astonishing to me that when, and you know, you know it, um, you know it mentally, you can kind of conceive it, but when you're sitting there and you have all of these books around you your whole life, you know, as AA, and here it is right in front of you, it's just amazing. I remember the first time that I walked in the office of the general service office, and I was, um, it was my first year as delegate. And if none of you have been there, you must come and visit your office. It is yours. And when I walked off the elevator, we were on 475 Riverside Drive, and we're on the 11th floor. And when I walked up the elevator and got off, and I turned to the right, and I saw our circle and triangle. It's, represents 
Lives Saved, a program of recovery that works beyond our group, beyond our areas, beyond U.S. and Canada, worldwide, in over 180 countries. It transcends language. Um, it transcends beliefs, culture, ethnicity, everything. You know, this program works for everyone. What a blessing. Um, today, I forgot another marriage. <laughs> okay, I know. He won't hear this tape, though. <laughs> the I was about a year in, in uh, the program, and this was... I was still trying to get sober. And so it was my, it was a year when I was still trying to get sober, uh, one of my three years. And I had met this, um, this one man. I'd been told really that, excuse me, that anybody that was really active and serious in the program was, um, I should stick with those winners. Well, <laughs> literally, um, <laughs> There was one that, I mean, I did not want a relationship, but there was one that, that I was attracted to. And, uh, and it was a great home group, happened to be my home group, eventually the Capital City group. But he was the secretary of that group. Now, what can be better, a secretary of a group? I mean, he's pretty honorable. And so, um, we started dating. It was an oddest relationship because, um, we didn't want to be seen dating, actually dating, so we go to meetings together. And uh, our sponsors didn't know for a while until they really found out that we were actually dating, going to coffee more. And I was living in a halfway house at the time because uh, that was through all of my lost my my down spiral, and I was in a halfway house. I thought I was living in the Hilton, I guess, because um, I... I just didn't realize, I mean, at that time, I still thought I had money. I thought I had a, che- I had a checkbook, but I had no money. I was writing checks. But, um, and I was living in this halfway house. I mean, it was just insanity. But anyway, so I was dating this guy then, and um, I was kicked out of the halfway house because of they didn't like the way I drank one night. And so I didn't have any place to go, and my sponsor had fired me at that point. So he said, he said, you can live with me. And he said, it doesn't, he said, no, it's just a place to live. There's no strings attached. You don't, you know, and he truly was, um, was, this was the case at that point. And I didn't want to live on the street, so I moved in with him. And I never left. Um, I told him, uh, he said, you know, we, we really should think about either getting married or, and I think I said that or he said, I don't remember who, but we thought we should get married or I should leave. Well, at that point I wasn't, um, I really did love him. I mean, he's the one man that I did love. And I knew though that I had to do a fist step. I said, I can't marry you till I do a fist step. So I did. And we got married and I drank one more time after that. And, uh, he can, if he were present, he could tell you that he probably, he said, I needed to see the, you, the way you drank because he understood um, my disease. And he, he said, you drank just like me. Now, he had a year when uh, when we got married. And so he was, he's actually two years more in the program by the time that I got sober. So anyway, uh, yes, that's my marriage. And before I actually sobered up, and he's still with me today. Um, he's not here with me this weekend, but he's still with me today. Uh, so, my life today, my mother, who didn't speak with me, for she absolutely threw me out of her life, because she couldn't have a daughter that went to jail. She couldn't have a daughter that um, did all the things that I did that she couldn't understand why she didn't know about alcoholism. Um, all my friends, all my family, but the, like I said, the most important thing was my daughter. 
I did not have my daughter. Not until actually I was sober for a while and she came back to live with me. We have the best relationship today. The closest relationship. She's also in the program. She has two years of sobriety. Thank you to you. And she struggled just like me, drank just like me, and yet she's sober today. I mean, what a blessing. Um, My mother and I were able to have a relationship before she passed a year ago that uh, I'll forever treasure. Um, my sister is, is, uh, she's the last member of my family, but she is uh, talking to me every day and she, she's very supportive. She was one of the last people actually that stuck with me at the very end. I'll never forget that. She stayed true and didn't understand the disease, but she was there and we're very close today. You know my life at the general service office. You know that I'm, that, uh, I have, still have a relationship with my husband. Um, I won't go into detail about all that, but we are just, you know, life today is beyond anything I could have ever imagined or planned or planned. Um, The steps of recovery in this program, all three legacies have put me where I am today in a place where my belief in a higher power surprises me every day with what I've been given surprises me of what I can do every day, you know, and what I can share and how I can share and how I can really be me. You know, for so long, I couldn't be me. I didn't know who I was. I didn't like who I was, but I really didn't know who I was. I didn't feel comfortable with me. And today, I'm just really an open book. I believe deeply in being honest I believe in this program and what it's taught me about um, sharing with others, carrying the message. I believe that we, can, that by listening to one another, we can find the answers with each other by talking with one another, with sharing with one another, being with one another. But also, I believe that we need to be productive outside the fellowship. This fellowship is not taught us to just isolate within AA, but to be outside of AA and to be useful members useful members of society, and it's given us that ability. And I just want to thank you so much for being a part of my life this weekend. And when I came into AA, I didn't like any of you. I could not understand you, but I certainly, and I was so closed, and I was so afraid, you know, of you. And today, I have to say I love all of you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.